So today we begin our study of Revelation. We're starting with chapters 1 and 2. So the question I probably get asked more than anything, how close are we to the end? My, t- my answer is usually a day closer, a year closer, because nobody knows. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 24 that only the Father knows. Many have tried to predict it and have failed. I mean, there have been ministry after ministry and leader after leader trying to figure this out. But the Bible is clear. Only the Father knows. So I cannot teach anything about when it's coming outside of it being in the Bible. So the author of the book of Revelation is John. And he had this happen through a series of visions He wrote what he saw, and an angel interpreted it. Now, when he was writing this, he was exiled on the island of Patmos. So he wasn't having a really good time. It's not like he was on vacation or anything. He's on on this wonderful island, you know, and he's just enjoying... No, no. He was exiled there. And God gave him all these visions... And the angel to help him go through all this. We begin in Revelation chapter 1. The revelation from Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants what must soon take place. He made it known by sending his angel to his servant John, who testifies to everything he saw, that is, the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. Blessed is the one who reads it aloud, the words of this prophecy, and blessed are those who hear it and take it to heart, what is written in it, because the time is near. John, to the seven churches in the province of Asia, grace and peace to you from him who is and who was and who is to come, and from the seven spirits before his throne, and from Jesus Christ who is the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, and the ruler of the kings of the earth. To him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood and has made us to be a kingdom and priests to serve his God and Father, to him be glory and power forever and ever. Amen. Look, he is coming on the clouds, and every eye will see him even those who pierced him. And all peoples on the earth will mourn because of him. So shall it be. Amen. I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. I, John, your brother and companion, in suffering and kingdom and patient endurance that are ours in Jesus was on the island of Patmos because of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. On the Lord's day I was in the Spirit, and I heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet, which said, Write on a scroll what you see, and send it to the seven churches, to Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamum, Thyatira, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. I turned around to see the voice that was speaking to me. And when I turned, I saw seven golden lampstands. And among the lampstands was someone like a son of man, dressed in a robe, reaching down to his feet with a golden sash around his chest. The hair of his head was white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were like a blazing fire. His feet were like bronze, glowing in a furnace. And his voice was like the sound of rushing waters. In his right hand he held seven stars, and coming out of his mouth was a sharp double-edged sword. His face was like the sun shining in all its brilliance. When I saw him, I fell down at his feet as though dead. Then he placed his hand on me, and said, Do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am the living one. I was dead, and now look, I am alive forever and ever. 
and I hold the keys of death and Hades. Write, therefore, what you have seen, what is now and what will take place later. The mystery of the seven stars that you saw in my right hand and of the seven golden lampstands is this. The, step, the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches and the seven lampstands are the seven churches. So this is Jesus Christ who appeared to him, giving this revelation that was passed on to John. And there's an angel that will come and help him interpret all the things that he has seen. John was to pass this on to those who are being persecuted in what today would be modern day Turkey. It was, it was located on a peninsula that is surrounded by water on three sides. We begin with the greeting from John in the name of the Trinity. Jesus was faithful to do all he was asked to do on earth. And he is the ruler of all the kings of the earth. One day he will return with the clouds and every eye will see him. No doubt many of the mockers of our faith will tremble when they see Christ return. In verse 9, what does John see? It is Jesus walking with the churches which are symbolized as the lampstands. He is described from head to toe with his face shining like the sun. Our Savior, behold his glory, wisdom, and power, his majesty. And in his mouth is a sharp, double-edged sword. And in his hands he held seven stars. These stars symbolize the angels of the seven churches. They are safe and protected in his right hand. His sword is used to act against anyone who opposes his will. Now John was overcome by this. It says in verse 17 that John fell at his feet as if he was dead. Just the sight of Jesus was so awesome, so powerful, so overwhelming Jesus is the first and the last, still alive, though once he was dead, our Savior, and he holds the keys to death in Hades. Now, Hades is a Greek word, and it meant the realm of the dead. Sheol is the Hebrew term they would have used at that time. In some texts, Sheol was considered to be the home of both the righteous and the wicked, separated into respective compartments, in others, it was a place of punishment meant for the wicked alone. So John is instructed to write what he has seen, what is present, and what will take place in the future. We find the number seven in both the angels and in the churches. That is God's perfect number of completion. So in chapter two, we find what these letters are to each of the churches as we start to go forward and give insight into each of these letters in chapter 2. To the angel of the church in Ephesus write, These are the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand and walks among the seven golden lampstands. I know your deeds, your hard work, and your perseverance. I know that you cannot tolerate wicked people, that you have tested those who claim to be apostles but are not, and have grown and have found them false. You have persevered and have endured hardships for my name and have not grown weary. Yet I hold this against you. You have forsaken the love you had at first. Consider how far you have fallen. Repent and do the things you did at first. If you do not repent, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place. But you have this in your favor. You hate the practices of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who is victorious, I will give the right to eat from the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. So we begin with the church of Ephesus. Now the church had been corrupted by false teachers. Now we heard about this in Acts 20 and more recently in Paul's letters to Timothy. They were troubled by this group of people who taught the followers of Jesus 
It was bet, best to show their freedom from rules and regulations by eating food given to idols and doing other immoral things. The church resisted these teachings, but Jesus said that something was missing. The warmth of the love in their hearts. They became harsh, critical, and self-satisfied. The church needed to repent and show the love that they first had in their hearts when they were first saved. Judgment will come upon them if they don't change their ways. But to those who do what has been asked of them, they will be given the right to eat from the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. Now, there's a couple scriptures I thought tied into this. Matthew 24, verses 10 through 13. It says, At that time many will turn away from the faith and will betray and hate each other. And many false prophets will appear and deceive many people. Because of the increase of wickedness, the love of most will grow cold. But the one who stands firm to the end will be saved. This is what was going on in that church. Their hearts had grown cold. They knew the law. They knew the rights, the regulations. They knew to pray and do all those things. But they become so cold towards many of the people. They became bitter. They would attack them. God wanted, Jesus said, for them to come back and have that warmth of heart again. Now it's easy to get that way. We see so many terrible things happening in our world today that we get cold to that. You know, it used to be a big deal when you would turn on the television and on the news, someone got shot. But now we see that so often, it doesn't affect us the way it used to. You know, many times we'll have people that that are in need of help, but we've seen them do so many bad things that we're not willing to help anymore. Our hearts have grown so cold and bitter and hard, harsh, it's like, taking a heart of flesh and replacing it with a heart of concrete. That's not feeling. That blood's not pumping through it anymore. Now in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verses 1 through 3, I think this ties in as well. It says, If I speak in the tongues of men or of angels, but do not have love, I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and I have a faith that can move mountains but do not have love, I am nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor and give over my body to hardship that I may boast, but do not have love, I gain nothing. The world that we live in is full of evil and we grow weary and we grow angry because of it. We can't let all these bad things in this world put out the fire of our love that's in our hearts. Each one of us must love and look out not just for ourselves, but for all people. Don't be one of the people that walk this earth and who live for their own trinity, me, myself, and I. It's easily done. You know, the world will tell you, well, you're no good if you're not in this social group. Well, you should get this raise at work. You should work the most hours. You know, I've listened to so many of these people, they're, they're considered motivational speakers. Well, the only way to be happy in the life, you've got to outwork everybody. You know, there's a man by the name of David Goggins, and he was bound and determined to become a Navy SEAL. Now, David had a terrible life growing up. He went through so many different things. He was abused by his father. They had to move away from the East Coast to Indiana. They go there, and he's one of the only black kids in this small school, and he can't read. He's in high school, and they're just passing him along, and he can't read. And then David graduates, and he becomes... He goes into the military, and he goes in, and everything's okay, and he gets out, and he said, from there, I didn't know what I wanted to do with my life. I started spraying for cockroaches. Before I knew it, I was 300 pounds. 
And he said, I just felt sorry for myself. He's like, all I did was just eat and eat and eat. And that was how I lived my life. But then one day David watched this documentary on the Navy SEALs. And he said, I want to do that. He said, I want to try to do that. So he calls up all the recruiters and they said, how much do you weigh? No way, you're, not, you're never going to make it. And eventually he lost some weight. And he goes in and he becomes a Navy SEAL. He went through Hell Week three times because of different injuries that he had. And different sicknesses and illnesses. So now David, he, he got his goal and he became an Army Ranger. So David's done all these things. And he tells you, work every day. That's how you're going to get to where you want to go. Now, it's great that he lost the weight and everything, but our lives aren't to be so much about us and what we can achieve for ourselves. You know, it's about God and following after him, following after what he would have for us to do. There's so many times in life we try to move forward and we think this is going to be a good thing for us, but we've got selfish motivations for it. It's all about us. It's all about making us look better. It's all about us having the right car, the right house, and to looking better on the outside than everybody else. But more often than not, when we're so busy building our own kingdoms, we're forgetting about the one that God's created and how He would have us to serve and to honor Him and how we react in our relationships. That love needs to be there. You know, Jesus didn't just heal his friends, his family, people that belonged to the Jewish sect. He healed people who were foreigners. He didn't just do it for his people. We have to remember that not everybody is going to have the same faith that we do. But they may not meet another Christian throughout their life. And how we act and how we treat them, they're going to remember that. Let's move on to verse 8. This is the letter to the uh, angel at the church of Smyrna. It says, To the angel of the church in Smyrna write, These are the words of him who is the first and the last, who died and came to life again. I know your afflictions and your poverty, yet you are rich. I know about the slander of those who say they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. Be not afraid of what you are about to suffer. I tell you, the devil will put some of you in prison to test you, and you will suffer persecution for ten days. Be faithful, even to the point of death, and I will give you life as your victor's crown. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. The one who is victorious will not be hurt at all by the second death. So this church has suffered. They were not rich materially, but they were rich spiritually. They were persecuted by the Jews who were coming in and they wanted to prove themselves to be God's people. But truly they weren't in their actions. They belonged to Satan. More persecution is coming from the hands of the Roman authorities. Some will be imprisoned. Others will be killed. But this terrible attack will not last forever but ten days. They must be faithful even to the end. So at the end of their lives they will receive a victor's crown. It's not an easy thing. Life has not been easy for this church But those who remain will receive a reward. This life in Christ is full of pain. It's full of challenges. But I tell you, just as this church went through, we have to hold on to the end until our last breath is in our bodies. There was a very popular minister. He was a Hispanic minister. And they called him the Hispanic Billy Graham. And at the end of his life, he got cancer. And he said, every day as I got worse and worse, the devil would tempt me and say, do you really think you made any impact? You did any good at all? Are you even sure that you belong to Jesus? 
And he said, this came after me day after day and after day. And he said, on my deathbed, I knew, I knew that I had. I had served God and I held on to the very end. The devil was doing all he could to get me to give up, to turn away from God when I was going through this. And he died. He died, but he held on just like Jesus is telling this church in Smyrna to do. It's not easy. It's not like Christianity is this cruise ship. You get saved and you get to go around and everything's easy. Usually it's harder than it's ever been before because the devil wants you to give up. He wants you to turn away and reject your faith. We have to hold on with a grip like our lives depend on every second. Every breath depends on it. Verse 12, to the church in Pergamum. These are the words of him who has the sharp double-edged sword. I know where you live, where Satan has his throne. Yet you remain true to my name. You did not renounce your faith in me, not even in the days of Antipas, my faithful witness who was put to death in your city where Satan lives. Nevertheless, I have a few things against you. There are some among you who hold to the teaching of Balaam, who taught Balak to entice the Israelites to sin so they ate food sacrificed to idols and committed sexual immorality. Likewise, you also have those who hold to the teaching of the Nicolaitans. Repent, therefore, otherwise I will soon come to you and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who is victorious, I will give some of the hidden manna. I will also give that person a white stone with a new name written on it, known only to the one who receives it. In this church, the people are joined in with those who committed feasts to idols. We had just been reading about this recently in some of Paul's letters. And some were sexually immoral. Now, Balaam can be found in the book of Numbers as a non-Israelite prophet who served the king of Moab, Balak. So they wanted to entice the Israelites to eat their food and to be sexually immoral, and the church had to repent of these sins. See, way back then, Israel was, they were coming out with Moses and they're marching to the promised land. But these people knew that they would come through and kill them, so they had, they had this man who would come up to try to divine things and come up with ways to keep the people from coming through there and going on to the promised land. Jesus says what they are doing now is the same thing. Eating food sacrificed to idols and being sexually immoral. They live in a place where Satan has set up his throne. He's coming after the church, but Jesus has already died for this church. They have to hold tight to the faith. Now, what is the significance of this stone they were given? In that time, it was, they would give these white stones to people who were invited into an important feast. So that was kind of like your ticket, your right to be able to go in to this feast, this party. So Jesus is giving this new stone with a new name written on it not only to the ones who receive it, they are also going to receive hidden manna. But they got to hang in to the end. Even though Satan himself has a throne there, they must resist him. Imagine that. Imagine somebody prophesying that Satan has set up his throne right here in this place. You know, how would you feel? Would you be ready to stand against the attacks of the enemy who's right there all the time? That's what Jesus is asking for them to do. 
Verse 18, to the angel of the church in Thyatira, write, These are the words of the Son of God, whose eyes are like blazing fire and whose feet are like burnished bronze. I know your deeds, your love and faith, your service and perseverance, and that you are now doing more than you did at first. Nevertheless, I have this against you. You tolerate that woman Jezebel who calls herself a prophet. By her teaching, she misleads my servants into sexual immorality and the eating of food sacrificed to idols. I have given her time to repent of her immorality, but she is unwilling. So I will cast her on a bed of suffering and I will make those who commit adultery with her suffer intensely unless they repent of her ways. I will strike her children dead. Then all the churches will know that I am he who searches hearts and minds and will repay each of you according to your deeds. Now I say to the rest of you in Thyatira, to you who do not hold to her teaching and have not learned Satan's so-called deep secrets, I will not impose any other burden on you except to hold on to what you have until I come. To the one who is victorious and does my will to the end, I will give authority over the nations. That one will rule them with an iron scepter and will dash them to pieces like pottery, just as I have received authority from my Father. I will also give that one the morning star. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the church, churches. The church has made great progress in their community, but this church has been corrupted again by idle feasts and false teachers. One is likened unto Jezebel, who is found in First Kings, First and Second Kings in the Old Testament. The deep secrets will do nothing but drive them from God. God sees all that is going on there, and remember, nothing is hidden from Him. We can't hide our sins, and God will punish those who don't repent. If she, as well as her followers, don't repent, they will be punished. So we find all this idol worship, all these idol feasts, all these people being led astray. We could see why Paul was so firm in his letters to Timothy and Titus because of the things that were going on in the churches. And Jesus is firm with it as well. He says that, I see what you're doing. Now these so-called deep secrets, many of these people were led astray by these idols. Said, yes, God does this, but boy, you can get so much more if you drew closer to the devil. He can do this. He can provide you this worldly thing. I've, I've read so many testimonies and listened to so many testimonies of people got caught up in Santeria, devil worship, and the things that would happen. See, if you're following after Satan, he promises you have wealth. You'll become famous. There are so many famous people who go to witch doctors and people in Santeria and have these blood sacrifices done so that they could continue on being famous and rich. You know, I heard a testimony this week of a man. He was out in California and he said he had a bit of dwarfism. He said, I was becoming popular because I could do these videos. I became popular on Vine and then TikTok and YouTube. So I went out to Los Angeles so I could become even more famous, right? So he goes out there and he goes to this studio and he's like, I've done some work with these guys. And he said, hey, do you want to know what happens in this studio after hours? He said, check this out. He shows him this video. These women are chained up and naked in these cages and they're cutting their wrists. It was a promotional piece for a satanic party. And he said, I could name so many celebrities that you would know who were there. He said, Jesus 
Save me from that. I knew what was going on there was wrong. He says, I was raised a Hindu. My family were all Hindus. And Jesus saved me from all of that. He said, I had issues with drugs and alcohol. Because no matter how much attention I got on my videos, it was never enough. He said, I always felt like I didn't belong because I was shorter. I was smaller than everybody. People would make fun of me my whole life. He said, but God helped him overcome that. And he can do it for each one of us, just like he's telling these churches to do. Satan is at work all the time in all the ways. I've heard people saying that just singing the lyrics of some of these songs that they did, they were really worshiping Satan. And these were different genres. He said, because Satan wants those words in your mouth. It gives him an opening. We have to be careful in what we're watching, what we're listening to, what we're singing. You know, when Lang, Lang Martinez called me Friday, I, w- I was at work driving, but I, I took the call and Lang, Lang grew up in Los Angeles. He was actually a drug runner for a lot of the people in Hollywood. As a young boy, he said this, th- there was a man there. He was the only one who ever treated me like they really cared about me. And he said, one day that man sexually assaulted me. And I wasn't the only young man going through this in Los Angeles. And he shared with me a story Friday. He said, I was trying to get a hold of one of my friends, Robert. And he's like, I knew that Robert really struggled, that he had been sexually assaulted too. He's like, because I was there. He's like, it was after a, a Cher concert. One of the people who was there with Cher came in and sexually assaulted this young man. And he said, the man had gotten married, he had kids. But it just, he said he couldn't feel love. And he said, his mom said, he had called trying to get a hold of Robert because he knew the court, this man was finally going to get his day in court. This man who has sexually assaulted all these people. And he wanted to talk to Robert about it. And he gets a hold of Robert's mom. And she said, I'm sorry, Lang. Lang, right? And she said, yeah. Did you play baseball on such and such a team? Oh, yes, I did. did. Did your mother make this type of food? Yes. What was the team's name? He said, I, I wanted to make sure it was you. And she said, I'm sorry to tell you this. But Robert died two months ago. She said, he, he just told me, Mom, I can't feel love. He was married, he had children, and he still couldn't feel that love from them. He says, Mom, I, I can't even feel the love from you. So he would live homeless. He would take off from his family and just live homeless. He felt like he couldn't be loved in any way, shape, or form because he had been sexually assaulted in that way. And he never told his wife that. He never told his children that. He never told his mom that. And Lang says to her, you want to know why he was that way? This is why. And he tells her what had happened. And he said, I am going into that court to see that justice is done. You know, we we hear things all the time about how great it is in Hollywood. You know, everybody's famous, they're rich, their lives are perfect, they don't have any problems. We can see right now, Satan is the problem in Hollywood. And these people won't let it go. All these things are going on all the time. And remember, even if this man somehow gets off in this trial, I told this to Lang that God saw it. And God will judge him. God will do the punishment. Because Lang was feeling so much pressure. He said, I've got to make sure this guy gets put away. I have to. And he says, and to some degree, I still hate this man. I don't hate him as much as I did when I was a kid. Because back then, you wouldn't believe the things I said that I wanted to have happen to him. He says, now... It's a little bit tamer, but I'm still angry with that man. He said, God's the only one who can help you let go of that anger.
We find the people in this church resisting. There's a small remnant of them resisting and being faithful. They'll be rewarded and share in the royal rule of their land. Suffering may happen to all of us. But in the end, if we hold tight, we will be with Jesus forever. I mean, when I was reading the scripture about eating from the tree of life, I was just picturing this big giant tree, probably bigger than this building, you know, that wide, that's been there forever. And that's what all the people in heaven are eating from. And to be able to have that opportunity to go up to that tree and be allowed to eat from it, what an amazing blessing that must be. Even though Jesus lived, died, and rose again, we don't get to see him all the time. But how amazing it must have been for John to hear these things from Jesus. He says, hold tight and fall not into temptation. Now the trap of sin is not easy to escape from. Many will be led astray, but I tell you to stay strong in the Lord. We need to read God's Word and apply it to our lives. We need to spend time in prayer about all things at all times. We need to worship God and serve Him with all of our hearts. See, we get caught up in things all the time like, oh yeah, I was supposed to pray for this person, but man, I got caught up in a book and this was a really good book and before I knew it, I fell asleep. You know, or, ah, this my favorite TV show came on and I got distracted. Don't let these things keep you from God. Because even though we don't see Jesus walking among us here on earth anymore, that doesn't mean that He doesn't love us. He loved each and every single one of us before we were even born. And He knew that we would sin. Each and every single one of us. In some way, somehow. But He still died for us. It's not like that conditional love, like I'll love you, but you can't do this anymore. You can't go there anymore. You know, I've, I've met lots of people with families battling addiction. You know, the husband or the wife is gone. And the other one's left there holding the bag, taking care of the children. And it is so hard for them to let go of that anger. I'm doing all this stuff. Where is God in all this? Why does He still love them? They don't deserve it. But that's not the way God operates. I mean, we can look back through all the people throughout the Bible that God has used. Moses himself killed someone. Look at the life of David. And all the mistakes he made before he became king. He was anointed to become king. And his life wasn't perfect. If anything, it got worse. He went and killed Goliath for the king. And yet the king sought to kill him. It doesn't always make sense down here, does it? You know, we, we do all the right things. We follow after Jesus and then... We get sick, or a family member dies, or a neighbor we were close to, or the finances just run out. You know, we, we have this job and then we don't have a job. But God says He will provide for every need, every single one, and that's hard. Because a lot of us have been raised to be self sufficient. You work hard, you save your money, you do this, you do that. Everything's going to be all right. There's just no guarantee. I've met people who seem like they did all the right things. They're getting close to retirement. And that's when the stock market crashed. Did God still provide for their needs? Yes, He did. And I've met people who were addicted to drugs and alcohol all the days of their lives where no person who had ever met them would think they deserved mercy. Yet God saved them and used them. 
See, the trap of sin, it's not a, it's not a trap you notice right away. It's almost like boiling a frog. You know, at first the frog's in the pan, but the water's not hot. So they don't think to jump out. But slowly it gets turned up and turned up and it doesn't notice and then it's too late. You know, sometimes we think we're doing sin and we can get away with it. Nobody sees it. It's no big deal. But it takes hold. And it starts to affect other areas of your life. You know, it's a, it's a strange thing. I've, I've watched lots of documentaries on serial killers and some of the things on how they got started. And some of them, they said, I started with pornography and I started killing animals. And then I finally moved on to people. Now, a lot of people think pornography not a big deal, right? You're just watching something. It's, how, how could it possibly affect you in that way? I've heard testimony after testimony of saying, once they did that, it allowed the devil to take hold in their life. To twist things. But their hearts grew very cold. We must be careful that our hearts don't grow cold and we hold on to the faith even to the very end. And like I said, it's hard. And there's times I've said, God, you've got to soften up my heart. You know, I'm going through this, I'm going through that. Or this person's treated me unfairly. And you just, you get to the point where you're angry at anybody who isn't going through all the things you're going through. You get jealous of those people who get the promotion or get the new car. They got married and you want to get married. And you just don't think it's fair. But I promise you, if you hold on to Jesus all the way to the very end, that life in heaven will be better than anything you could have had down here. Think about people who go and they find buried treasure or they find these shipwrecks. Now those people who had that money when those ships went down probably thought, I've got it all figured out. i got more money than I could ever imagine. It's all going to be okay now. And that ship went down. It could happen to anybody. Do not put your faith in your financial situation. You have to put it in God. Look at the lives of the people that He used. They weren't rich. They weren't the talk of the town. They weren't in the right social groups. As soon as they accepted Jesus, they were outcasts. And we can look at that in Paul's life. We just finished reading all those things that Paul had done and been through. Paul was in the right sect. He was a Roman citizen. He had an amazing education. But that's not what made him valuable to God. Is when he gave his life to Jesus and said, I will do whatever you ask me to do. That's when he really had value. That's when he was really important. Not important so much to the people in Rome, but to God. He knew he would do what he asked him to do. And that even if he had to die, he would do it. One day, we're going to have to stand before God. And there will be judgment on all people. Every moment of our lives will be combed through and no stone is going to be left unturned. Some may try to point out the good that they did, but it doesn't outweigh the sin. See, all of our good deeds are like filthy rags before God. How then can any of us be saved? It's through Jesus Christ. It's through Him alone. It's not from being a good person, doing the right things. 
being kind to your neighbor, though those are all nice things. So accepting him as your Lord and Savior. Now you're putting him first as Lord. A lot of people just want the Savior part. I want to be saved. I want to know I'm going to heaven and not hell. But they don't want to do the Lord part. They don't want to follow after him. Think about the people he chose. He chose Matthew, a tax collector. What did he say to him? Follow me. What did he say to the brothers who were fishing? Follow me. That's what he's asking each and every single one of us to do today. Now we can reject him. We can say, hey, I don't want all that. My life is great down here. But then you're punished when you die. And it's hell. Eternity of pain, of torture, of torment, of loneliness, of darkness. And there's no relief. Not one second of relief. Or we can dwell with Jesus. There's no more pain, no more fear, no more worry, no more anxiety. Maybe Jesus will bring us up to that tree of life and say, come and eat. He loves us more than anyone else ever will. He didn't just die for one of us or some of us that did some good things. He died for all of us. That we could be forgiven and spend eternity with him. And if you are ready to receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, repent of your sins, please pray this prayer after me. Dear Lord, please forgive me. I'm sorry. I take Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. I put him first. I repent of all of my sins. Please make me clean in your eyes. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen.